Hello and welcome to this special edition of Scripture Verse by Verse, Resurrection Sunday edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. And for that, we are in Matthew chapter 28, and we will begin in verse number 1. So get your Bible and open it up to Matthew 28, verse 1, if you can. I've got to say, and I'm sure this is the case with many of you, this is by far my favorite, my favorite day, and I'm about to deliver a message from the Word of God on my favorite subject, the resurrection. Without that, we wouldn't have any nothing, anything. We wouldn't have any guarantee that our sins are paid for, and it's a, it's a good time, good time in the Word of God. So, remember, you can study the whole Bible with me, Genesis through Revelation. There are four series at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, and that's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Well, let's pray and get into today's message. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> okay. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Now, I will not say that going to the tomb took faith because they didn't have any faith, Mary and the other women. They really didn't. They didn't believe the word of God. They didn't believe, more specifically, the word of Jesus when he said that he would be raised, even though he had said it several times. They did not have faith, but one thing they had, two things. They had devotion, and they also had courage. It was courageous to take spices to anoint the dead body of a criminal that Rome had just executed. It took courage to take spices and oils to anoint the dead body of a man whose tomb is being guarded by Roman soldiers. And so their devotion to Jesus remains strong, even though he think he think think they think that he's dead and dead to stay. As far as these ladies are concerned, Jesus has absolutely nothing more to offer them. But that doesn't matter. They're going to honor him because they want to, not because they feel they're going to get something for doing it. It came from their hearts. So you got to appreciate these ladies. In spite of their lack of faith, verse 2, And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. I just love the show of power by God here in verse 2. The Roman soldiers thought they were in charge of this tomb. Boy, they had it all taped off and sealed with the governor's seal. They thought they were in charge. Big tough guys, you know. And boy, were they ever wrong about that. God was in charge. And God put this mighty angel in charge. Anyone who can bust through a band of Roman soldiers, move a stone that weighs several tons, and then sit on it, gets to be in charge. Gets to be the boss. And that's what this angel did. So it really didn't matter who wanted that stone kept in front of the tomb. God wanted it moved, and so moved it was. God wanted it removed. You say, yeah, to let Jesus out, right? No, to show the world that he was already out. This tomb was empty. Verse 3, the angel, his countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. 
And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Uh, it takes an awful lot for a Roman soldier to shake with fear. They didn't fear much on earth. And they didn't fear God either. They were the type who thought it was uncool to worship God or care about being right with God. It's for women and old ladies and old people, you know, that sort of thing. And there are, the, there are people like that today. But of course, they're playing a game of let's pretend. They really are phonies. Those who think that they're too tough to worship God are only kidding themselves. And that will become evident, like it did with the Roman soldiers. One second in the presence of a single holy angel caused these guards to quake with fear. And anyone who goes to their grave with that attitude, the attitude of these Roman soldiers, they will quake with fear too. Those who are too hard to humble themselves before God in this life will tremble like scared puppies before God in the next life. This was just an angel. This wasn't even God. And it had them all shook up. Verse 5, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, for I know that ye seek Jesus, who was crucified. Notice how the angel told the ladies, told the ladies specifically not to be afraid. The ladies didn't have to be afraid because Jesus was their friend. They were devoted to him. They were right with God through Jesus Christ. As for the soldiers who were terrified, they should be terrified. If they're terrified enough, maybe they'll repent and make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. The reason the angel didn't say, oh, don't be afraid to the soldiers is because as it stands, they are a heartbeat out of hell without Jesus Christ, and they should be afraid. Anyone who hasn't repented and received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior should be afraid. you got reason to be afraid, and if you're not, you're foolish. Anyone who has not received Christ is a heartbeat out of hell and has absolutely no reason to feel comfortable ever. And any preacher who even suggests that a person is okay and ready to die even though they have never repented and received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that preacher is a false prophet who will answer to God for playing a part in the damnation of that soul. Verse 6. The angel says, he's not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. The angel says, he's alive, just as he said. He throws that in there. And it is too bad that the followers of Jesus did not believe him when he told them that he would be back after three days because they would not have wasted three days being sad, grieving like those who have no hope. They would have looked forward to Sunday morning with anticipation, knowing that they would see their Lord again, back and better than ever. No funeral would be sad if you knew the person was only going to be gone for three days. I mean, that's like a little vacation trip. That's a, that's a long weekend. That's no big deal. So they wouldn't have been sad if they would have believed Jesus. So these ladies, these followers of Jesus, were very sorrowful and all for nothing. The good news is their unbelief didn't keep Jesus from coming back. Just because someone doesn't believe something is true doesn't mean it's not true. Unbelief does not stop God from doing what he says he's going to do. You just don't have that much power to stop God. Unbelief does not cause God to change what is true. Word of faith, people, you just don't have that much power. You may think you do, but you're into 
witchcraft. That's what you're into in your incantations. It has nothing to do with the Word of God. Unbelief doesn't keep the Bible from coming to pass. The Word of God is true. Its prophecies are true. Its promises are sure whether anyone believes them or not. People may deny God, but the Bible says that God cannot deny himself. Seven. So the angel says, And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. They acted quickly. Just as the angel commanded, they ran to the disciples to give them the news about Jesus being alive. And did you notice they had both fear and joy? Which is kind of strange, but not really when it's connected to God. They had fear and they had joy. Connecting with God makes us afraid because he's holy, and connecting with God also gives us joy because he's loving, and it's great to be in fellowship with our Creator through the Savior. We experience fear because we know we should be in trouble with the God who hates sin, and we know we have sin, and yet Christians experience joy because we know he treats us better than what we deserve because Jesus has paid for our sins. And we're forgiven. So we can have that fellowship. Fear and joy. Verse 9. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Jesus said, All hail. Or rejoice. And that's, that's one command they won't have any trouble obeying at all. Everyone has different ways of rejoicing, you know that? In their case, it was to grab Jesus by the feet and worship him. They were so happy because their Lord was back. All they could do was cling to him, and they were not going to let go. They just clung to him and worshiped him. That's all they could do. That's all they thought about doing. They were so happy to see Jesus alive after what they witnessed on Friday afternoon. And by the way, the fact that they grabbed Jesus by the feet proves that his resurrection was physical, literal, physical. They were his feet, and they were his feet that were connected to his legs, and they were solid enough to grab, and that's good for, for us. That's good news for us if we know Christ, because the Bible says that our resurrected body will be just like his resurrected body. He is the first fruits. He came back to his old body, only it was much improved, and that's it is, that is exactly what's going to happen to you and I if we know Christ. Our body will be better in every way, but it's still going to be our body. You must get used to that body you're into because you're not changing. Oh, it's going to be improved. It's going to be raised. It's going to be glorified, but it's still, in essence, that same body that you're in. It's going to be wonderful. Just look at Jesus. Get a glimpse of what you're going to be like. You'll be able to walk on the new earth just as Jesus walked. And you'll be, able to, you'll be able to talk in your resurrected body just like Jesus talked. You'll be able to rejoice as Jesus rejoiced. You'll be able to touch and be touched. In fact, you'll be able to do everything that you do today and then some. The only difference is you'll do it better. Thanks to Jesus, instead of burning in hell, you and I who belong to him will have a wonderful forever in store for us. 10. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there they shall see me. Jesus says, Don't be afraid. And he said that because there's nothing to be afraid of if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Good news is the only news if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. The good we experience today can be enjoyed. The bad we experience today will result in a greater spiritual good down the road. See, we can't lose if we belong to Christ. The only news that there is for Christians is good news. So Jesus says, don't be afraid. What should be afraid of? It's all good news. The good that you're experiencing now, you can rejoice with Jesus for that good. The bad that you're experiencing now, know that he promises to work together for our good. It'll be more good news later on. It's just good news. That's all we got. You know why? Because Jesus is raised from the dead in his physical body. That's what gives us the assurance that all, all our news is good news and it's just going to get better and better. Everything's going to be okay in the end. The troubles we experience in this life will fade instantaneously the moment we enter the next life. Anything we may have sacrificed for Jesus in this life is going to be repaid multiple times in eternity. May God help us to remember that and cause us to sacrifice and serve him even more. Just out of gratitude. Verse 11, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. These Roman guards are as good as dead and they know it. Oh, do they know it. Roman commanders were not very understanding. They, they did not accept explanations when you failed to do your duty and the guards failed to do their duty. They failed to guard the tomb and they know that the penalty for that is death. Consequently, they go to the religious leaders, not to their Roman commanders. They go to the religious leaders hoping that they can devise some sort of a cover-up for them. So look at 11 and 12 together. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave much money unto the soldiers. I'm sure the Roman guards told the religious leaders all about the earthquake. I'm sure the Roman guards told the religious leaders all about the angel and the empty tomb and the resurrection and the whole ball of wax. All of which means that the religious rulers who scheme to murder Jesus are in big trouble. And if they have a half a spiritual brain in their head, they know it. The resurrection means that they have killed the Son of God. Think about it. Almighty God raised the one that they killed, which is a pretty frightening thought. If you kill somebody and God Almighty raises them from the dead, doesn't that mean you're in trouble? I would say, the resurrection means they were dead wrong when they corrupted justice to ensure the execution of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it also means that if they do have that half a spiritual brain, they're going to fall down on their knees right here and beg Almighty God for forgiveness. But no, no, they will not do that. Instead, they will take counsel among themselves. Well, that's brilliant. You ought to be on your knees talking to God, begging for forgiveness. Instead, what do you do? You take counsel among yourselves. You're going to try to scheme and figure something out. There's nothing to take counsel about when one comes face to face with their sin. There's nothing to think about. There's nothing to discuss. A guilty sinner has no bargaining power. You have no leverage. The only thing that makes any sense is repentance and crying, crying out to God for mercy. They take counsel among themselves. Well, look what they do. This is their brilliant plan. 12. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave much money unto the soldiers. So they're going to throw money at this problem. Well, I'll tell you what, throwing money at this problem is not going to solve it. 
But you would never convince the religious leaders of that. They thought that money could solve pretty much any problem. Throw money at it. You know why? It's because they're greedy themselves. They are greedy themselves. They would sell the truth for a bribe, and they have done that. So they figure bribes work. It's the norm. It works. They bribed Judas, and it worked. So now they're going to bribe the soldiers. And sad to say, you know what? It's going to work again. Bribes do work. They don't work forever. Eventually the truth comes out. If not in this life, then at the great white throne judgment, the truth does come out. Bribes do not work forever. Bribes work temporarily. They may delay the day of reckoning, but they won't get rid of it. So they're just kicking the can down the road by throwing money at this thing instead of repenting. 13, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. We got a great idea. They say, here it is. Tell the people this lie. And then the people will think. Tell the people this lie. And then the people will think. And then our problem will be solved. The religious leaders are absolutely insane with sin. There is no other explanation for their actions and their reasoning here. You know, who cares what people think? The religious leaders don't want people to know that they killed the Son of God. They know they killed the Son of God, but they don't want the people to know that they killed the Son of God. They don't want the people to know that Jesus was raised from the dead. They don't want people to know how wrong they were about Jesus. The problem with the religious leaders and others like them is that they care more about what people think than what God thinks. Hell will be filled with people who care more about what people thinks, think than God thinks. Because that's what gets you into hell. Fear of man. Fear of being ostracized. Fear of not being popular. That's what gets you into hell. You care more about what people think than what God thinks. You can't get any more foolish than that since Almighty God is your judge. 13 and 14, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. This story has so many holes that I just don't know how anybody could possibly believe it. Really. Just consider, consider. The disciples who ran off terrified when Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane they would not risk going to his tomb, which was sealed with a Roman seal and guarded by Roman soldiers. Do you really believe that his disciples would come to where it was guarded by the Roman soldiers and try to defy what they were put there for? Like they wouldn't fight to the death to save their own life, the Roman guards? You think the disciples would be brave enough and have enough guts to do something like that? There's no way in this world. That all by itself cancels out this lie. And secondly, hypothetically, even if they did try to steal the Lord, they would not get past those soldiers. These are fishermen going up against trained Roman soldiers. There's no way in this world that they're going to get by those soldiers. soldiers. Furthermore, even if, even if they did get by the soldiers, they wouldn't have taken the time to unwrap the body of Jesus and fold up the shroud nice and neat before they left. See what I mean? It's just craziness. Additionally, the guards could not have known that the disciples took the body if they were sleeping as the story, as the story goes. This is just a crazy explanation for the empty tomb. What a stupid lie. Pitiful is what it is. 15. So they took the money, soldiers did, 
and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day, which just goes to show that many people are too lazy or too complacent to think. Many people don't want to be bothered with the details. They want to do whatever it is that they want to do and leave the thinking to others. Man, if you're buying this lie, you'll buy anything. You're not a thinker. Many people do not take personally the responsibility to think through their beliefs to see if they line up with Scripture or are even logical. No wonder people are so easily deceived. No wonder so many believe this ridiculous story about the empty tomb and died and went to hell. 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. You know, some doubted. You say, oh, that proves that this isn't the word of God. Are you kidding me? It proves just the opposite. Some doubted. The Bible says that. If the Bible wasn't the word of God, if the Bible was simply a book written by man, then that little phrase, some doubted, would never have been written down. Man would have never wrote that. Only someone who is dedicated to pure truth would be honest enough to mention that some doubted. So verse 17 is, is strong witness to the divine inspiration of this story of this book of Matthew. Verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, has always had all authority because he's the eternal Son of the eternal Father, the second person in the Godhead. He's always had all authority. But, but now, for the very first time, Jesus has a new kind of authority. His death on the cross changed everything. His death on the cross paid for our sins. And since that's the case, he now has the authority to give forgiveness to anyone who repents and receives him as Lord and Savior. 19. He's got this authority, so notice. Go ye, verse 19, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Christianity is not just a Western civilization religion. There aren't different ways to heaven depending on which continent you were born in. Jesus believed that he was the only Savior. Jesus believed that he was the only way to heaven. The resurrected Christ knew he was the only way to heaven, or he never would have said to his disciples, preach the gospel everywhere, make disciples of all nations, all people, no matter where they are. I'm so grateful for the Internet for mass media that is getting this word to multiply who knows how many countries. Last time I checked, it was, I think, pretty near any, every country in the world. It's true. One thing that the church should major in, by the way, when I talk about church, I'm talking about Christians. One thing that Christians should major in is the one thing that Christians alone can do, and that's preach the Lord Jesus Christ, help get the word of God out to the entire world the best that you possibly can. 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the earth. You know, we grieve Jesus when we sin, but he sticks with us through good times and bad through holiness and sin. He'll never leave us, no matter what. I'm with you till the end. He will get us to heaven, no matter what, with the one exception. If we want him, then he wants us, flaws and all. It's true. If we turn to him or return to him in repentance, he will accept us every single time. And I'm out of time. Thank you so much for spending part of this Resurrection Sunday with me. I appreciate it so much. I hope you had a good time in God's Word. There's a reason to have fun here. There's a reason to enjoy this. 
if you belong to Jesus Christ. Remember, study the whole Bible with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. And if you would like to be a part of this ministry, pray for me and God's word and also click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. See you next time on Scripture Verse by Verse.